This podcast brought to you by Flock Safety, where technology can unite law enforcement and the communities we serve in the pursuit of a safer, more equitable society. Flock Safety builds devices that capture objective evidence, uses machine learning technology to uncover unbiased leads, and sends real-time alerts that prepare officers to be effective and efficient in the field. Uh, look, guys, I'm a detective, and before they were ever a sponsor of the show, used Flock Safety every day. I used it countless times with uh, the technology to include car thefts, package thefts, and, and violent incidents. If you're a patrol officer or a detective in dispatch or even in command staff, you need to check out Flock Safety. These incredibly powerful devices are so much more than your average expensive license plate reader. They're solar powered. They can be installed virtually anywhere. In side-by-side tests, they are 30% more accurate than the old legacy license plate readers. They can capture multiple lanes of traffic, vehicles traveling 100 miles an hour. Uh, And the best part, they were built within the principled framework that never sells their data to third parties. And the exact same technology that I use every day is available for neighborhoods, businesses, law enforcement, and citizens of all sizes. Think about that. Members of the community use same tech so we can all work together in public and private partnership. If you want to learn more about Flock Safety, go to flocksafety.com backslash two cops. That's F-L-O-C-K-S-A-F-E-T-Y dot com backslash the number two and the word cops, C-O-P-S, flocksafety.com backslash two cops. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by HRH Combat Arms. They can turn your vision into reality. They specialize in gunsmithing and Cerakoting. Your Cerakote specialist is Air Force veteran and retired police sergeant Paul Ware, a.k.a. the Sarge. He can Cerakote your firearms, auto parts, tools, even your sports equipment. And then your master gunsmith is Marine veteran Steve Miller. This veteran-owned business is located at 5025 Saunders Suite, 103, Fort Worth, Texas, 76119. You can call them at 682-304-0363. And you can find them online at www.hrhcombatarms.com. That's www.hrhcombatarms.com. All right, welcome back to Cops One Donut. I'm your host, Eric Levine. I have a special guest with me today, Robin Krause. He's cracking up because I'm over here being like a radio personality. It's kind of weird, ain't it? It is very weird looking at you doing this. I know, it is. But the cool part about it is once you drink more of your beer, the funnier it gets and the more fun you'll have. So, yeah. So what's up, buddy? Not much. How are you? Good. I haven't seen anybody in a long time. I know. They stuffed you away again. I won't say who they are, but you know who they are. But I, it's a secret. To be fair, yeah, I know it's such a big secret. Like if you have, if you've ever played Clue, you should be able to figure it out. Keep it for you're any good at it, um, <laughs> right? So, uh, yeah, uh, Robin is a friend of mine. Um, I met him through work, but he's been a friend to my dad a lot longer because they work together. Um, Robin has been a cop for about 45 years. <laughs> no. No? 36. 36. 36 years? Yes, sir. Damn. That's awesome. You still having fun? Oh, yeah. That's what I figured. Yeah, I'm not going to. I know. I, I say I want to retire at 50 so I can teach. I'd like to go teach. But if I'm still having fun, I, I don't think I could quit. Yeah. So. As long as you enjoy getting up going to work, that's what matters. Yeah. So Robin's had a pretty big career so far um you've done a lot of specialized units and all that stuff but before we get to that um i want you to talk about just where you're from you know we'll get get your background a little bit maybe uh if you did any school anything like that and then uh tell us how you got in police work to begin with all right i've been i've been schooling i've been in schooling okay how do, how deep do you want me to get on this dime uh, so where were you born, state, what made you want to do police work? Well, I was fortunate enough to be born in Texas, unlike some people. Amen. Um, I got here as fast as I could. Actually, uh, grew up in Hearst for a little bit. Um, 12 ish, 13 years old. We moved to East Texas, a little town called Van, just outside of Tyler. 
near Canton, Texas. First Monday Trades Day, Canton. Is it down by a river? No. It's not no, a van. We weren't down by down a river, river. and we, we were fortunate enough not to live in a small van. Okay. In van. In down van. By the river. In van. Nice. <laughs> right? I see how this is going to go. Okay. Yes. Um, so, graduated there. Uh, went to uh, Henderson County Junior College for a semester, which is now known as uh, Texas. It's not Texas State College. It's one, it's one of the UT satellites now. Um, ended up in San Antonio, going to the U- UTSA, Go Roadrunners. Okay. Um, started out in the science field, microbiology. Uh, didn't take long counting fruit flies to figure out I didn't want to do that. Okay. Um, Chose architecture, uh, moved back up to the Metroplex, uh, went to the big booming University of Texas at Arlington, um, also known as UT Almost, and um, graduated there with a Bachelor of Science degree in architecture. Uh, Started in that field for a short period of time. Um, Different things happened as far as what the future held for that profession. And uh, was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I was looking in the Fort Worth Star Telegram when I still read the Star Telegram and saw an ad there. Said, okay. Uh, you, Fort Worth Police uh, Department's hiring. So I called them up. I said, Hey, uh, what do I need to do? And they said, Well, you got to have 32 hours of college. And I was like, Well, I got that. Mm-hmm. They said, Well, come on. They required a college? 32 hours of college back in that time. Oh, okay. So how old were you when you went through school for the architecture? Just normal. I mean, Just I, graduated, straight. I graduated from UTA when I was 23. Okay, so you straight out of high school jumped yeah. in. Oh, yeah, okay. right, right into college. You know, the whole thing. It's yeah. The so, expectations and all that. Yeah, so you grew up privileged. I get it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh, okay. Okay, all right. so, all right. yeah. Um, I won't get into what's in my driveway right now, so. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, we already discussed that. Mm-hmm. So. I'm just saying, if we we're in Russia, that wouldn't fly. Well, fortunately, <laughs> we're not in Russia. Hey, Amen. Capitalist, baby. So, all right, architecture. Yes, sir. Dude, all right. See, this is why I like doing this shit, because I always find out something awesome about people that <laughs> I never <laughs> knew. Uh, like with Pablo. Yeah. Pablo was on the last podcast in Hollywood. I mean, I knew he he said he did some stuff, but then as he yeah. goes into it, and he basically, I think he was a spy for us. That's, but that's I, possible. I think he was a spy because my man went to Russia, yeah. Morocco, um, Liverpool, uh, all sorts of places, Mexico, um, all over the country or all over the world. I should do you say. Just, do you just want to replay his? Yeah, I should. Episode? I should. But we the can just sit here and watch. Point I'm getting to uh, <laughs> is it's awesome. Like I would have never known that had we not sat down and. Yeah, he's a very very cosmopolitan man yes he is yeah culinary he was a ski instructor i didn't know that one in aspen i did not know that i one. know so uh the so chef, with, the chef part i did know and he's very good but you with architecture yes, never sir. never would have put that together because you don't ever like i know you you can bake like that's one of your unique things i know about you you can bake and uh you bake cheesecake right I have a company that's on hold right now, yes. Okay. I'm waiting for a, a... COVID to go away? Well, no, waiting for a kitchen. Oh, okay. Um, I was partnered up with, still partnered with Zach Watakill from the Chop House. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's my business partner in there. No shit. Mm-hmm. Damn, dude, that's awesome. Uh, so, so what you're telling me is that you may want to sponsor my show with your cheesecakes. Well, I have to sell some first. Oh, okay. Then, then we'll talk about it. You're an architect, so you could build your kitchen. <laughs> well, you could design it. We'll put it that way. I don't know if you could build it, but so with the architecture thing, did you did you ever use it? When I got out of uh, UTA, I went to work with a friend of mine that I graduated with. Uh, he was already working for a company out of Burleson, and they were the the pioneer for um, CAD systems. Oh, okay. Uh, and it's not Tektronics, and I can't remember the name of it. It's been a minute. But they, we were testing out different CAD systems for this company. Um, and basically, one of the things that we did was we mapped all of the sewer lines and water lines and water fire hydrants in the city of Fort Worth. No shit. Yep. Dang. 
That's awesome. I, I just learned not too long ago, maybe a year or two, that uh, under Fort Worth, there was like subways or something in Fort Worth that one time. That was down at Tandy. The, the tunnels are still there, I believe. Okay. Man, I wish that would have been cool. Yeah, it was It was interesting. We used to go there when I was a kid. There was an ice rink. Underground? Uh, it was on the lower level, yeah. You know where the Dude. Tandy Towers are? Yeah, yeah. That used to be a shopping mall. It's kind of sort of a business plaza now. Yeah. I think that's but, coming back. Yeah, well, you would park in Panther Island, what is Panther Island now, mm-hmm. and you see those little sheds that are out there in the parking lot. Yeah. That's the subway stops. Oh. So you'd get on the little subway and you'd ride them maybe a half a mile. Yeah. Well, when you're going, if you go down 7th and you see the glass pyramids yeah. in the middle of the street, and you look down and those see are the skylights to yeah. where the subways used to come in. Now it's like a eatery. Yeah. Like you can sit down. Well, we used to pull in there and there was a little coffee shop. Used to love that when I was a yeah. kid because we'd get a soda or something. So I was, um, I was and joking. When I say soda, it was a real soda. It wasn't a pop. It was a, they made the soda there like a regular soda fountain. Oh, that would be good. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm telling you how long ago it was. Yeah. What is it they say now? Tell me without telling me? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tell me you're old without telling me you're old. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Right. Oh. You're just racking them up today. Mm-hmm. You'll catch up. I know you will. Mm-hmm. Um, today, guys, we are drinking. I'm drinking Spindle Tap, and this is delicious. I've never had this one. And I bought another one that I've never had. And he's struggling <laughs> over there, but he's a champion, so... Uh, yeah, we won't name it since it's, it's not going to get a good review. Oh, I'm going to drink one after this. Are so you? yeah, you'll probably like it. I um, I have a. It is exactly what it says it is: peanut butter and jelly. Yes, porter. Yeah. Yes, and I am drinking a. It's called Faded by Spindle Tap. It's it's a barber's can, which that's what attracted me to it. Um, my mom was a barber back oh, in the yeah? day. Yeah. So did she do any of the bloodletting? <laughs> You mean uh, use a straight razor? No, you know that's what the stripes mean. No. Because barbers used to also practice medicine. What? By, and one of the popular things in medicine back in the day was yeah. bloodletting, and they, that's what the stripes indicate. I mean, I know what bloodletting is, mm-hmm. but I didn't know that barbers were doing that. Yeah. That's kind of creepy. Oh, dude, I'm a warehouse of... Useless, useless knowledge. I know. Oh, that's one of the things I was going to brag about you is like it. It's one of the fun things I had with working with you is like, I'd be like, I got this problem and I wouldn't, you wouldn't even address the problem. It's like, did you know back in uh, 1862? And I'm like, <laughs> what does that got to do with my thing? And he's like, no answer still. Hold on. Let me get to it. And I'm like, oh my God, that was cool. Now, what are you going to do about your problem? I was thinking of doing this. That sounds good. Go with that. Shit, you didn't even answer my question. You made me answer my own question, and he just agreed with it. <laughs> so, very cool leadership style. Um, before we get into, like, your career and all that stuff, one of the things I want to say is, like, for people out there listening, there's all different sorts of leadership out there. And you've got your 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 book leaders, you know, the, the nerdy academics, um, lack the social skills, but they stick to the book, you know, black and white guys. And you got your other guys that are like, um, too scared to make decisions, just period. And you got other guys that they, they're able to toe that line back and forth. They can keep their bosses pleased. They can do a little bit further, but they, they, they toe the line pretty well. Those are the, that's the majority that I see in leadership. They just toe the line. Um, and then you got your patents, a generals and, and <laughs> the ones that, I don't want to say make the upper mad, but always do what's right by their people. And that's your style. Always doing what's right by your people. Um, if it's right. And that's where you're unique as a leader. Like you'll call it like, no, you fucked up. Like, and you'll call your guy out and you won't, you don't have to defend that. Cause now they know they messed up and they own up to it. But that's the type of leadership that I always saw with you. And I know when people start hearing you talk and talk about the stuff, they're going to start seeing that. No. At right, I mean, right <laughs> away. So when you start hearing him, he's got more of the General Patton uh, style, in my opinion. Um, he's not going to fall on the sword if you're wrong. Like, if you're wrong, he's going to tell you you're wrong. And he's not the, I'm going to defend cops just because they're cops. Like, if you fucked up, he's going to tell you. You messed up. You need to own this shit. And that's what I like. Keeps it Keeps it real. Um, I tend to surround myself with a lot of people with your style of leadership. You know, I have you, Stephanie Ricks. I was just talking to Stephanie Ricks the other day. I'm like, like, I, 
you were great as a leader. You're a hard ass. And uh, do you got to take that? Uh, it's my boss. So I'm going to send him to text. Okay. <laughs> I saw the name. I was like, if you got to take that one, that's cool. No, nah, he's on vacation. I'll call him. Oh, all later. right. Um, so, yeah, Robin's leadership style is uh, it. it's slowly fading. It's hard to find ones like you, sir. And I'm not kissing your ass because I don't give a shit what you think. But that's... <laughs> that's uh that's your leadership style to me. And I, I was very, very fortunate when I first started this career to work for some very, very good people. And we'll talk about that later. All right. Okay. So let's get back. I go down rabbit holes all no, the time on quite, this show. It's so, all right. Um you decide uh architecture's not for you. You see an opening for a police yep. uh place, uh and you need thirty two hours of college credit. Yes. Which is blowing my mind right now. Because if that was still the case, we'd miss out on a lot of good cops. Possibly, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm a big believer that, it, as a person with education, that that does not make you a good cop. No, it does not. Uh, it makes you, it provides perspective and opportunity. That's the two things that I think an education provides. And I, uh, the reason I think that the city had that, for several reasons, but I think the main one was it shows the ability to stick to something. Oh, okay. Yeah, I see what you're you saying. Couldn't, you couldn't be on academic probation, all sorts of other stuff. So. Okay. Makes sense. So you you apply. Yes. Is that correct? All right. So you apply. <laughs> go, go from there. So what, well, you want to know the, all the down and dirty. So, yeah, I want to know. So I applied. Um, things were a little different back then. We, we had to take a, um, a test, very first thing, uh, which I believe was a, a comprehension, English comprehension test. And it was equivalent to an eighth grade education level. Yeah. Fitting so, for so Texas. So I failed terribly. But yeah, no, fitting no. for Texas. <laughs> no, I, I, I passed it. I don't know what the grade was or anything. but Was okay. y'all in there? Um, I, I don't recall y'all being in there, but right. yeah. I've adapted to it. Well, I like it. As I, well, you should. I actually, instead of saying you guys are used, like. Yes. If you're going to benefit from our beautiful state, you need to. Yes. You need to acquiesce. Yeah, I, I have. I love it. I even learned a little Spanish, so. Did you? Yeah. Poquito. You know. <laughs> I know the two most important phrases in Spanish. La cerveza, por favor. Yep. Donde está el baño? Where's the bathroom? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Gets me through everything. <laughs> um, so, went through that process. They still had the background packet that you had to fill out, except back then we had to fill it out by hand. And then you came back, and they would go through that. And we also did a physical agility Um. Then after the background, uh, once they were satisfied with that, we would go to an oral review board, which we still do, but it's a lot different now than what it was then. Um, I remember walking in the room. They had the tables arranged in a horseshoe in a single chair at the opening of the horseshoe, which is where you sat, I sat. And I don't believe there was a single person in the room under the rank of captain. Um, there were nine of them, I believe, seven or nine. And then they just started peppering you with questions. And the reason it's so memorable to me is we had one of our first female captains. Her name was Arlene Kennedy. She was a great woman. Um, asked me several times, why do you want to be a police officer when you have a degree in architecture? And it just, I kept thinking, wow, I'm, I'm not doing very well here. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I made it through and started the academy. Back then it was only four months. Oh, so I started the academy in November, uh, November the 11th, and we graduated on March the 14th. Um, 1960 what? Oh, <laughs> you're full of it. You're, you're a hilarious guy. Uh, maybe someday your dad will tell you some jokes. Right, yeah. <laughs> 1986. 86. I was three years old, sir. Mm -hmm. So you you got on just before my dad. That's correct. Holy shit. Dang, bro. I'm glad you stuck around. I couldn't get him to. I could understand. Yeah. And now he's doing police work again, kind of. Really? His, I saw something. Yeah, PI stuff. Oh. Uh, yeah, so he's maintaining. He's driving a Ferrari. <laughs> You've got the Dobermans, so. Yeah, that's right. And the Hawaiian shirts. He got, nice, he could nice. get He could get by. Yeah, he needs something to see over the steering wheel. Though, yeah, yeah, he's short. So. He's short. He's uh, a little guy. Great guy. I love him to death. Um. Dude, four months, that was it? That was it. Wow. Okay, so 
help me understand because as a person with a degree, especially architecture, I would think being a cop would be a lot less financially. Okay. And this is what I had to explain to Captain Kennedy. Uh, when I graduated from college, I had a four year degree. And when I graduated, the state changed the licensing requirements because in architecture, you're going to make money if you're a licensed architect, not if you're just working there. Okay. You can have a degree, but in order to be able to <clears throat> be the man, you have to have a license. Oh. It's a big test, just like being a lawyer. You know, they have to pass a test, a state test. And they made the minimum requirement after, right after I graduated, you had to have a five year degree, which A&M had, or you had to f- go to a four plus two. And I had had my fill of college, and I was done. Yeah. So I was like, no, nah, I don't want to do this. Okay. And you have to understand, things weren't as crazy as they are now as far as compensation and things like that. Everything was a little bit more sane. Yeah. Um, I think when I started the department, we were making $17 an hour. And 86, that's good money. Yeah, it wasn't bad. Yeah. Um, so you get into police work. Had you ever had that? Because, okay, so most cops, most, mm-hmm. say it's a calling. Yes. Every once in a while you get that outlier. They're like, no, I'm doing this to stack my resume. I'm going to do a few years and I'm going to go into law school or I'm going to go into politics or whatever it is they're using the police as a stepping stone. Um, for you, was it something you knew you were going to get? It? I mean, if you're going for architecture, I can't see police work ever being something that would come across your mind. Okay, hopefully my mother won't see this because she doesn't have internet, so. Um, I got a degree to get a degree. Okay. I went to college because that was what's expected. Um, and I will be honest with you. When I graduated, I get, I started getting letters from the military right and left because they yeah. wanted college graduates. Had I known about the A-10 Warthog, I'd have probably gone to the Marines. Yeah, buddy. Um, I did not know that plane existed because I wanted to fly, but I was a little too big. You would have had to be in the Air Force. Well, I, even then, if I went to the Air Force, I'd be flying to yeah. You know, tankers and crap like that. Well, what I'm getting at is the A-10 is an Air Force plane. Yeah, but the Marines fly it, too. It, the Marines call us in. Uh, <laughs> well, yes. Okay. All right, Air Force boy. Yeah. I, I forgot. Sorry. Yeah. But anyway. Um, I just, I know there's going to be some military guys watching. <laughs> like, you better correct them. You better correct them. So corrected. Uh, no service in the military. Thank you for yours. Well, Absolutely. I really didn't serve much. I just signed well, it out Well, you line. were in the Air Force. I was so. in the Air Force, yeah. Um the chairs were all safe. Well, I will tell you this, um, and I'm not, you know, it's real. I don't talk about myself easily. I know. Um, That's why it was a bitch to get you on this fucking show. <laughs> um, I was raised with the attitude that we help everybody. Um, and that's the way I always was. And when I saw the opportunity that the police work was there, um, I knew that, what I was going to get from my mother because three of her brothers were police officers. And she told me very often when I was younger that she didn't want me to do that. Okay. Cause you know how little kids are. Oh, yeah. I want to be a cowboy. I want to be a fireman. I want to be a police officer. So she was very aware of what they went through. Yeah. Um, especially them being working for the, the Tulsa police department back in the sixties, fifties and sixties. You said it was her brothers, her brothers. Okay. So your uncles were cops. Yes. That's awesome. Uh, one of them retired with Tulsa. The other one uh, went somewhere else. I can't remember what. And then the youngest one uh, was a railroad cop. Um, so it was always there. This, the servant aspect was, has always been there. Okay. And so when I saw that, um, why not? I mean, it yeah. was just, it was a perfect fit. It was, it was an, a, not necessarily an epiphany, but it was Providence. Yeah. When that ad was there in the paper, I saw it as Providence. Okay. So. Okay. I got a question for you. Sure. So me growing up, I've had cops, firefighters, military members, all in my family. When I would go to a family reunion or a family get together, I think the draw for me from a very young age was the fact that those people in my family no matter how long they've been away, like including my dad, because I grew up in Michigan, he was down here. They were the center of attention. And I don't want to say it was because of the attention they got. It's just the, the reverence that they had with family. Mm -hmm. 
And that was the, I think that's where it started with me. And so for you having three uncles in police work, is it, was it the same when family would get together? Were they the draw, even no, though they may not have wanted it? It's, it's hard to say. I mean, I was, I was a lot younger when mm-hmm. we still did those reunions. Um, I'm the youngest in the family of some of the youngest of the family. Oh, you were the oops. Yeah. Uh, more than you can imagine. Oh man. Um, <laughs> so our reunions were more family based. Um, I can tell you that, that both the uncles that, that were in law enforcement when I was younger, both were very, very humble men. Uh, my mother's older brother who was the, who retired as a Lieutenant, I believe from Tulsa was a very, very humble man. Very, uh, self-effacing, very kind, and that's what I remember about him. Yeah. Um, the only reason I knew he was a police officer or a, a, a visual fact was when we would go to see them, he'd have to work sometimes, and when he came in, he would take his gun belt off and put it in the closet by the front door. Oh, okay. So I remember seeing that. So with respect to what you're saying, it wasn't really that much. And on my father's side of the family, we're talking about a bunch in northern Louisiana, Oh, so it wasn't, it was all about hunting, fishing. Hell yeah. Having a good time. That's what's up. I love, I, I, so you'll be my guy to go to, um, since I've been in Texas, nine years, Mm -hmm. never had any, um, actual Cajun food, no Creo, no gumbo, nothing. You have not lived. I know. You you poor soul. See, that's what's wrong with Yankees. You yeah. can say it. Yeah. yeah. That's what's wrong with the yeah. No spice, well, I, no soul. To be fair, to be fair, <laughs> there is so much Texas that I have been trying over the years that yes. just haven't got to it. Well, it's not all Louisiana. What you have to understand is Texas and Louisiana are basically the same state. Um, you really don't notice that much difference. If you go down to the Beaumont area, mm-hmm. it's, it's basically western Louisiana and uh, – West Louisiana is Far East Texas. Okay. It's it's very yeah. blended. I love East Texas. It's beautiful. Yeah. That reminds me of Michigan. It reminds me of home because of the trees. You know, there's just so many there's trees. There's trees in Michigan? Tons. It's not all Detroit and rusted, no, it's rusted not. out cars? <laughs> it's not. You got to stay. Okay, so there's Michigan. You got to stay up this way. Oh, okay. <laughs> if you go with that. Okay. I, yeah. Um, but, yeah, I, I really have been – you're – Probably the third person I think you talk about Providence and seeing signs and stuff. I've probably talked about Creo food three times this week. Yes, yeah. people have been mentioning it, so I think it's time. But uh, it, it is, yeah. So, but yeah, I was just uh, when you say you had three uncles in law enforcement, that's that's a lot. That's a yeah. I don't know why it does that. You need to talk to the the producer about that. Yeah, yeah. I'll yell at myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, growing up, like I said, especially military guys when they would come because they're always, they're always gone. And I think that was my draw. And then every cop that I've talked to that's non-military, just about if I, if we bring this subject up, one of their biggest regrets is never signing up for the military. Mm-hmm. Um, and I tell them like, listen, like you're serving just the same. I've done both. You're serving just the same. And they're both very needed, wanted positions. Um, I think nowadays more people are prone to sign up for the military before they ever sign up to be a now, cop. Yeah, now I see that. And I will tell you this, my father's side of the family, one of my favorite photographs, because my they were all World War II veterans, every, every one of them. Really? Um, awesome. My father was in the Army Air Corps before it became the Army Air, Air Corps. Yeah. Um, and, uh, one of my favorite pictures is his siblings and their spouses and every single one of them, spouses included, were in uniform. That's awesome. So that was, you know, then, yeah. you know, it's the greatest generation and absolutely, was absolutely. And always will be. So that was, that was telling for me that yeah. they had all served. So even though my father's side of the family didn't have law enforcement, they had that. Yeah. Could you imagine if what happened then happened today? That the do you think you're going to get the same type of outcome from our side of the house? 
You mean as far as law enforcement? Or? No, 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 no. Military wise, you're talking World War II vets, the um, greatest generation. Yeah. Well, you, you know, it's it's really not a fair comparison though because the military, the the the, the services are so much different. You're cr- you're right. Then. I just the 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 state of mind then versus the state of mind today. I mm-hmm. just can't see. You know, and and I will tell you this: it's it's easy to get lost right yeah. now. And this is one of the things that I I talk to the younger officers about because it's always worse when you're in it. And I've been in it enough and gotten out of it to understand that. Yeah. So what you seem to think and perceive as something never before done, in some respects that's true. But overall it's not. Yeah. We've been through this before. Yeah. The difference between then and now is it's a lot noisier now. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. noisier because social media. Social media. Yeah. The internet. The fact that five people own all the media sources, things like that. Yeah. So George Soros. Yeah, and it, and it's just it's noisier. Yeah. But you still have the same makeup. You know, mm-hmm. people are people. They're never going to change. We've been through this time and time again as a as a country. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily just as human beings, because we have as human beings. If you're a student of history, which <clears throat> I love history, mm-hmm. you can see it over yeah. and over again. So we'll be okay. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. I can agree with that perspective. See, that's why you're awesome. Ah. You're only able to explain it to me different. Um, okay. So you get into law enforcement. Mm-hmm. All right. It's not something that you saw coming necessarily, but it was in the back burner. It was a possibility. When you're getting into it now, what's the path? What are you thinking? Like, are you thinking I'm going to be, well, back then, I guess it would have been, am I going to be on a patrol horse or am I going to be on foot? So, um, (laughs) uh, but no, just wow. But for real, like what was like, did you, were you going to be a SWAT guy? Were you going to be a tactical guy? Uh, Okay. Um, (laughs) I have been, for lack of a better term, I've been a floater. Um, I've never really planned anything out, especially when I was younger. Um, I was fortunate enough to be in the places that I was in to be able to coast, for lack of a better term. And and that's one of the regrets that I have uh, as a looking back on the life is that there were a lot of times that I just relied on my intellect. And I'm not trying to brag, but, you know, I was always able to just – I was always able to get by. Yeah. Um, I didn't have to study until I got into college, um, and it, you know, kicked my butt. So, kids, stay in school and study. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I I was in athletics, and growing up in East Texas, you know, athletics was the king. Yeah. And I'm not saying that I got a free ride because of that, but, um, you know, I could comprehend things and understand and get get through stuff without really applying myself, which again, I regret. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was a kid. Right. You know, Um, I did have to suffer through both of my brothers who were older than me being borderline geniuses and, you know, listening to the, well, I know you can do better because your brothers can't and all that sort of stuff. Ah. So when I went into police work, it was just see, let's see what happens. Okay. Uh, when I first started, you know, and as I got exposed to it, then I had things about that I saw that maybe I wanted to do. And I wasn't always chosen or successful in gaining those positions, but I've been very, very, very fortunate in my career. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so with uh, the, the, you've had a long career. Yes, sir. Basically, take me down. First, I want I want you to take me down. What did you do? What were all the little, all the units that you've done? Okay, I want to. I know it's a long list. Did you need to write it down as you go so you can keep track? Um, but no, if I write it down, I'll forget something. Okay, because so. I'm trying to get to where you're at today. I'm trying okay. to keep everything kind of chronological. But at the same time, I want you to tell me the units you did, and then once we get to that, I want to know what was your favorite. First, what one you were like, eh, it wasn't what I thought it was going to be. Um, started in patrol. Um, 
and I'll use some police vernacular just because I apologize in advance. Um, went through training, went through field training, and got cut loose solo status on the north side. So when I started, there were only four divisions in the city. And you have to understand, Fort Worth was only a third of the size of what it is now, um, geographically and population-wise. It was pretty small. And we didn't have as many officers. Um, so I started out on the north side, and then we had to put our preferences down of where we wanted to go once we got officially turned loose. And my first preference was the East Division because I'd never worked there. Uh, all through training, I did North two tours and then did West on a tour. Never worked East Side. Heard all about the East Side. Um, was assigned to East Division Midnights, which I love Midnights, always have. Um, was fortunate enough to be on the, in the same district with one of my very, very, very good friends in the Academy, Kelly Carruthers. Somebody you absolutely need on this show. I know. I definitely want Cowboy on here, man. Um, Kelly and I went through the Academy. We, we've been good friends for a long time. Um, and I remember we were on the same shift and the same roll call because we had early units and late units. And we would go to roll call, come outside, load our cars up, drive over to the parking lot at Poly High School, and push 10-8 and just rock and roll. Yeah. Um, so... That was very enjoyable. Did that for a few years. Um, saw that the opportunities were there to move up. Uh, I, I promoted to corporal in 1990, corporal detective. Was assigned to East Division Detective Office, and they had just put the detectives back in the divisions. Uh, they were centralized before that. Um, again, fortunate, fortunate, fortunate for who I worked for. Um, in, th in that office, did that for a couple of years, um, became probably that unit more than any other was where I got disillusioned. Not necessarily disillusioned with the work we were doing, because we were doing some really bang-up stuff. But I, I became very disgruntled with the, the process, and I'll try to be as nice as possible. But one of the problems people don't seem to understand, or if they do, they don't want to talk about it, or they don't necessarily disagree with it. In law enforcement, our biggest, biggest obstacle is not the people that we're targeting, the people we arrest, the people that are committing crimes. Our biggest obstacle is the district attorneys. And when I was in the detective office, um, it was very evident to us from our perspective that there were certain percentage of cases that the district attorney would disallow because they didn't have enough to do or, or didn't have enough attorneys or whatever their excuse was. And uh, it, there were different stories I could, I could tell you, you know, anecdotes all day long. But as a young police officer, which I was, you know, I'd only been doing it for six years, five to six years, uh, I became very, very disgruntled with that aspect of the job where I had to argue with a, with a district attorney to get open and shut cases to be accepted. And as a detective, even though when you're, as a patrol officer, you see the same people a lot of times, but as a detective, you see them more. Right. Especially if you can't put a case on them. And you have a, a, an airtight, open shut. You know, we had one where uh, a guy wrote out a handwritten confession. And it was no build by the grand jury which if you're involved in that process at all, you know is a slam dunk for the DA. Yeah. If they want an indictment, they're going to get one. So it was things like that. At that time, <clears throat> uh, Bill Clinton was the president, and uh, crime was out of control. Uh, crack had hit the streets. Uh, not as many homicides as we had had when I was a rookie, but, you know, a lot of high-profile stuff going on. And the federal government started a program called Weed and Seed, and they selected a very few cities in the United States, and Fort Worth was one of them. And our distinction was we had the largest geographical area for a Weed and Seed project. Um, J.C. Williams was the lieutenant in Weed and Seed at the time. He was, one, he was my sergeant when I first became a detective. And he approached me and asked me if I wanted to come into the Weed and Seed project, and I was like, absolutely, get me out of this office. 
Uh, as a detective? As a, as a corporal, yeah. Okay. Corporal detective. Nice. So the reasoning was I had experience in writing arrest and search warrants and things like that, and which is what we did. We were pretty much pioneers for targeting crime, especially drug-backed crime. Uh, we wrote our own warrants, um, not necessarily arrest warrants, but we did a lot of search warrants. Um, and it was a, a federally government-supported program, and we were working 10-hour days but we were also working five days a week. Oh. So we would get 20 hours of overtime a pay period, and as a corporal, I was making captain's pay. Damn. Which was pretty exciting. Heck yeah. Um, but if without a doubt of everything I've done, that is the best time I've ever had. There were bad times, don't get me wrong. You know, A couple of our officers got shot. Uh, we were involved in some fatal shootings. And not that anybody wants to be involved in that, but... As far as the camaraderie, the, the the closeness of the unit, the impact that we had for the citizens, yeah, we were terrifying the criminals, which is what any cop wants to do. Right. And we were helping the people that lived in those neighborhoods that were being the victims of the crime of these predators that were out there. So it was probably the most satisfying thing I've ever done. Can you explain for those that don't know what the purpose of Weed and Seed was? So the program was named because, you know, the feds like to name stuff and make it sound all cool. Uh, Weed and Seed came from weeding out the criminal element and seeding the community with money and programs to help it grow and get out of any kind of economic uh, pitfall that they were in. And um, because of that, we were the weed portion. And um, because we were working 10-hour days, five days a week, we had a four-hour overlap with evening shift. And every other night, for four hours, we got to do whatever we wanted. And most of that was drug crimes, uh, narcotics dealers, that sort of thing. Yeah. We would do our own cases. We had our own fund, our own CI fund. We developed quite a few confidential informants. We would make drug buys on our own. We would then run the case with that. Then we would write the search warrants for those drug buys, and then we would execute them, Yeah, which was unheard of. We did go through training. Um, that's another reason that I was brought over there was to be the trainer for the rest of the of the people in the unit. So I was trained through different agencies on the dynamic entry warrants because that's the way we did things back then. And we rocked and rolled. I mean, we we were averaging three, probably three search warrants a week. We would hit a door. That's a lot of search warrants. And the, the, the best thing about it was within... Uh, probably 10 months, we had reduced the violent crime in the Wheaton Seed area by 75%. What was the, because I, I can just imagine people hearing that today mm -hmm. and the negatives from that, but what was the citizens' response? When we first started, it was, you know, just like anything else. They were unsure of what we were doing. But as um, we became more involved, um, we didn't just do drug warrants on our on our free time a lot of times we would go out and do things in the community mm -hmm. we would go into neighborhoods and just visit with people um and what a lot of people don't understand is that this the, the concept of neighborhood policing is not new and it, it never has been think back on back in the in the 19th century with the beat cop right he was the neighborhood police yeah. officer he would walk and in. we did the same thing it just wasn't called anything different yeah so we did a lot of community engagement, and we were very successful because of the support we had from our lieutenant, and was J.C. Williams. That's another one you need on here. He could tell you stories for days. Um, he was very, very, very good at, at doing community relations, talking to the community, and we never hid anything. We never were secret about anything, and they started to see the results, and because of that, we began getting more and more and more information and more and more and more support. So in that area, the community rallied around us and we around them. Okay. So it was very successful. Yeah. I, and and I, I'm sorry, but the only reason I, I wanted you to explain more and more about it is just because every cop that I know that's been involved in weed and seed, it is their favorite portion of police work they've ever done. Yes. And part of the show is, you know, cause and reason is to 
help people understand like the why and why we do things and all that stuff. And I think I've had two other people on here that have talked about weed and seed and all of them said that the, the citizen um, response at, at the end was just like, thank you. Like it was, it was a great program. Yes. And I just don't see that being allowed today. I don't know if the need is there necessarily. No, no, it absolutely is. (laughs) But I think programs like that, call it, like you said, call whatever you want to call it. But the proof's in the pudding. It it worked. It worked. And it strengthened the community relationship with police. Yes. So I love love hearing stories about weed and seed. I don't don't know how much deeper you want me to dig into what you just said. Go, um, go as far as you want, baby. Well, I, I'll tell you this, that I believe that as, as a patrol officer, um, we began to lose sight of why we were there as a, not me personally and not the people I worked with, but we as a collective, we began to lose sight of why we were there when they created specialized units to handle that portion. When they created the NPO program, then all of a sudden it wasn't the patrol officer's duty to, to do that anymore. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We weren't we weren't going out. We weren't expected to go out and right. and ingratiate ourselves to the people that we were there for. Right. You handle we, the calls. Yeah, and you, you handle that's the it. calls and you let the NPO do that. Yeah. And I think that's a, a tragic outcome. Right. It's it's a disservice to the citizens and it's a disservice to the officers. Because I can probably tell you the main reason why most of the people speak of Weed and Seed and working in Weed and Seed fondly was because it was doing what you were wanting to do. Everybody that starts this job, <coughs> excuse me, says the same thing. I said it, you said it, we all said it. And I hear it still today when I do oral review boards for the people coming into the academy. Why do you want to do this job? I want to help people. Yeah. And that, more than anything I've done, was helping people. Yeah. Because we knew everybody. We got Because we were in that area all mm-hmm. the time, and we were in there helping people, helping their neighborhoods, helping them get rid of the problems in their, in their block. Mm-hmm. It was, it was uplifting and satisfying. Yeah. And I think that's what we're missing. Yeah. Um, I think that we have gotten away from humanity, mm-hmm. not just in law enforcement, but as a society. Oh, I mean, for it's sure. ridiculous. Yeah. And that's one of the things that I've talked about when I teach in classes is, you know, let's, let's show everybody our humanity. Because that's what it's all about. Yeah. You know, I didn't get this job and you know, it's a it's a bonus to get to drive fast and, you know, put people in jail, but that's not why I did it. And that's not why you're doing it. It's not why your dad did it. Yeah. We're doing it to help people. We 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 want to be servants to the community and we want to show our humanity and and recognize that people need help. And we're not allowed to do that. Yeah. It, it's funny because all these shortfalls that you think that you said is um, possibly why we, we've fallen away from that is exactly the need or or, or the reason I I started this Mm -hmm. because we, nobody looks at you as a human anymore. They look at you as a uniform. Now I'm putting a voice to it, but at the same time, I want to bring community on here and, and let them explain their side of the house and basically bridge that gap and, and do what we used to do do. That was the purpose. But now, like you said, there's this, um, disconnect that that's happened because specialized unit, we depend on our NPO. You're, you're the bridge. Like I'll tell you what I need. They tell you what they need and you relay that to me. Screw that. I I will tell you fortunately, and I know this personally from working with you and then working with some of the younger officers, that desire is still there. Right. It is absolutely still there. And uh, when I did my tour as a midnight duty captain, it's still there. It just needs to be fostered. It needs to be nourished. It needs mm-hmm. to be honed. Yes. And that's where our shortfall is now. Yeah. Um, it's all about numbers now. Uh, and administratively, we've lost sight of what we are supposed to be doing. Why are we here? Yeah. And it's very disheartening to me to watch this happen to my profession mm-hmm. and my police department. And I feel like I can say that there's only t- three other people. So this is my department. I gotcha. 
So it's your department too. No, it's, it's not. It's long. Yeah, it is. No, it, 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 no, it absolutely. <laughs> I is. mean, it is, but I can't say that on the show. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm sorry. It's, I don't know who you are. I don't yeah. know what you're doing. Forty-eight minutes. Yeah, and Edit twenty that. seconds. <laughs> Put a mic squelch in there. I'm sorry. No, you didn't good. give me any ground rules. So. No, no, you're good. I'll, so that you know, that's what I think, and I, I think I can speak to it somewhat. Not necessarily professionally. I can speak to it from a very, a very objective and very valid point from seeing all the things that I've seen. Mm-hmm. You know, this is what I, I, I've said this so many times. I, I'm not the shit. I am not. I am not the greatest police officer to walk the face of the earth. I'm not. I've worked for some really, really damn good ones. Mm-hmm. And I worked for the greatest lieutenant that ever graced the halls of the Fort Worth Police Department when I was a rookie. And I'm not that. But I've seen a lot, mm-hmm. and I can see it happening over and over again. History runs in a cycle. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's I, I it's, can't remember the saying, but it's something. Um, hard times create hard men. Yes. Yeah. You, you, yeah. you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And hard yeah. Men, hard men's defeat hard times and create easy times and easy men. Easy times easy, create easy soft times create men. Soft men. Yes. And soft men cause hard times. Yes. I mean, it is. It's a cycle. Yeah. It is. Yeah, um, absolutely. The fortunate thing for us now is with, with social media, with the internet, the cycles are getting smaller. Right. Awareness, everything like that. I agree with you. But I'm, I, I, I want to say that my, uh, everybody's got their, their strengths, their weaknesses and stuff like that. Sure. Um, one of my big weaknesses is that I care what people think about me. Not, not like, you know, all oh, your piece of shit type of dude. I, I don't care about that, but work wise, like I put a lot into what I do. Um, I don't always put the best effort and I don't think anybody, anybody can say that. Like, you know, I I have my strong days at work. I have my weak days at work. We all have those, but, um, I take this, like I'm this doing this. I'm not on duty, but the whole purpose of this is behind my work. What I do, I take my work home with me. So when I hear people say, you know, say something bad about negative about you, what you do at work and stuff like that. Like, and that's my flaw. I take it personal, but at the same time, it's also one of my big strengths because it drives this type of thing because I'm trying to fill that gap mm-hmm. of what you're talking about. What you guys had strong at one point and it's faded away I'm trying to bring it back. And I don't, this is the only way I know how to do it. So I'm trying to do it this way. It's not the way, but it's a way. So no, I think you were doing pretty good. Yeah. So it's going all right. It's, yeah. it's growing. So, but, um, and it's not to bring attention to me or the show, but it's the, the point. It, like you said, we're trying to do the right thing. We're trying to be that. We're not always strong at it, but that's the intention behind why we do what we do. So I am, and I can attest to exactly what you said. You definitely fostered doing police work. And, I'll just give a small example because it's one of my favorites that I, 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 you know, I was an academy instructor, so I would bring this up all the time when I was in the academy. I got forced, voluntold, if you will, to do um, FTO. I was a field training officer for a day because the FTO was sick that day. Um, Lindsay Stewart, shout out. Uh, she was sick that day, so I filled in for her rookie. Now, we get a burglary call. The beginning of the night. We're midnights. You were a midnight Sorry. Lieutenant. lieutenant. You're a midnight lieutenant. We get a call, and it's a, a burglary call right at the beginning of the shift. I was like, that's your call. We're going to go take that one because that's the bread and butter of what we do in patrol. You know, I'm in my mind, I'm like, you know, it's our first phase, so let's, let's just go handle the bread and butter stuff. That's the easiest way to start learning. So we go handle this burglary call. It's in an area of... Um, it's one. It's in the Fairmont area for anybody that doesn't know. It's basically you got like these, multi, not multi million, but million dollar homes some, next some to. Some of them. Are, yeah, yeah, some of them are million dollar homes, and they're next to like crack houses. So, it's just a weird dynamic. And um, we get this burglary call of a guy that was flipping the house. His that's what he does for a living. Flips houses, and he his trailer got stolen with all of his tools. Three hundred thousand dollars. Remember the number. Three hundred thousand dollars worth of tools, um, in his trailer. So we go handle that. Boom. We're done. 3 a.m. rolls around. Another guy uh, on our team calls out. They need a female to do a search. So I got my rookie. We go out. We do the search. 
while she's searching this girl who ends up having something, some sort of paraphernalia on her filled with maybe apple juice. I don't know what it was, but, um, <clears throat> she starts spilling her guts about this red trailer filled with tools. Now, nobody else knows this story. And I, I recognize it immediately. I'm waiting for my rookie to see if the light bulb goes off. And it did like, to her defense, like immediately, like she, <laughs> she was excited. She looked at me and I was like, uh, yeah. So, um, we had some arrestable offenses with this female, but in, in the search for the greater good, we, we allowed her, we used our discretion and presented that to our sergeant and our sergeant happened to be riding with you that day or something to that effect. And was like, uh, we got to ask the lieutenant. He's with us, you know. So we asked you, and your your basic response was, do you want to do police work? I'm training, so I I do, but I can't answer. I got to let her answer. And she's like, yeah, 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 yeah. So she's into it. It's like, All right, cool. And we find out that this trailer of tools is at some hotel room. So I tell you, I'm like, this is what we got. This is what I'd like her to do if you're cool with it. And long story short, not only does he allow us, he uses his discretion as a leader to let us continue to, to recover this, try to recover this stuff. You let me and my team go out and basically get everything back. We arrest the guy that stole it. We I take my rookie to the detective's office. She gets to see an interview slash interrogation. Um, and then as we're at the interview, which you were probably long gone at home by now, um, Somebody spotted the trailer itself. So we recovered the trailer. We recovered all the tools at this hotel room. And it was you that we were worried about a search warrant. And then it was you that came up with the idea. Well, who, who checked out the room? And I was like, Oh shit. I didn't even think about that. Like, and shit, it was the girl that we had. She checked out the room and you're like, do you give us permission to look in your room? And she's like, yeah, I do. And you're like, there you go. And I was like, we, so we, because of your experience, we avoided a search warrant. We didn't have to have a search warrant because we had permission. She signed consent for us to go in her room and we go in, recover all this stuff. That guy had just been released from jail like two days prior. And it stuck out to me because one, it was, I was training somebody. So it was a really cool call. It ended up being like a 24 hour call because we went to the interview and then we had to do the report and then we had to recover the trail. I mean, it just kept. I didn't get home until the sun was up, so, um, which was great because I was getting FTO pay. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, the, I just thought about that. So that was great, but that's an example of the type of fostering that I was getting to. That you, you didn't just say no because it would have made it safer for you. As a, as a, why did you let them do that? If something would have went bad, because let's face it, police work sometimes you got to earn your fucking paycheck. Mm -hmm. And that could have been the time that we earned our paycheck. Um, and a shout out to Johnny Salazar. He was the first one through the door. He would not let us go through. So as a sergeant, um, that was the day that I earned a lot of respect for him because I was like, all right, I'll go through first. Um, and I was even going to make the rookie at the end of the line. You know, I was like, you come in last, but me and Sergeant were in. Sergeant's like, nope, if we're going through that door, it's going to be me. I was like, all right, cool. It was it was just a really cool call. It stuck out, and uh, I think it's a good example of the fostering that you're talking about. And you're not just talking it; you do it. So that's why <laughs> I wanted to bring that up because not many people know that story. And this story goes a little deeper. There's more to it, uh, but I don't want to get on it here. But uh, if any of my friends want to talk to me about that call, I'll tell you about it. So, but good on you, bro. Well, and that's why we're here. I mean, yeah. And I love doing police work. I still do. Um, and that's what, you know, maybe I'm a little bit selfish because as, as you progress up through the rank, you have to live more vicariously through the people that you're working with. Yeah. So it's always nice to see that. And I also remember how I felt when I was allowed to do police work, the feelings that I had, uh, of accomplishment of doing why doing a job that it was absolutely the job that I wanted to be doing. Yeah. You know, how did that make you feel recovering the property, oh, man. putting somebody back in jail that needed to be back in jail and, yeah. and maybe having a person that's got caught up in stuff and, and maybe was influenced and maybe you might've had an effect on her. Who knows? 
Yep. Yeah, it was it was it was great as a cop just to do cop work. Mm-hmm. But it was even more fulfilling, and that's where the instructor side of me came out of <laughs> part of it. But just so one day I was an FTO, and to see her face the entire time, like she's just happy to be along for the ride, and I was <laughs> like, "This is fucking awesome." So, uh, yeah, I got my. I think that solidified me knowing the route that I was going to, I wanted to train eventually. And I'm sure I'll, I'll circle back around on that. Cause I can't help myself. Yeah, sure. I'm always, I always feel like I'm in a training role, mm-hmm. constantly trying to teach people, even if they're not ready for it. Well, and, no. And I get it because yeah. people like ourselves, I, I, I thoroughly enjoy being a trainer, instructor, facilitator of knowledge. Um, the main reason is because I was a beneficiary of that myself. Yeah. So not only is, is my, my goal to help the citizens, but it's also to help other cops to pass on what was passed to me. Yeah. And that's why I'm still here because I feel like I haven't given back enough. Mm-hmm. I have not balanced the checkbook for what I got when I started. Yeah. I get that. Um, all right. So you move on from Weed and Seed. You, you've done several units, all right? I'm trying to... Do you want me to go through the pitfalls and the upfalls? Not yet. <laughs> um, because I, I, th- I think you hit the nail on the head with, with what we've already discussed. Um, we're exactly an hour into this. Okay. So uh, I don't... The, the reason, okay, if you guys are listening, the reason I, I brought him here is because he's uniquely qualified perspective, whatever you want to call it, um, with dispatchers. So yeah, yeah. explain that please. <laughs> yes. So, um, and what I mean by that is from a leadership role as an officer, um, uh, and I say officer, that's what he does for a living, but, uh, rank wise captain, correct? Yes. So you are a captain and, um, run the, what's, generally referred to as a communications division for let's say the nation like your dispatchers it is a underappreciated uh underrealized um job that is in my personal opinion uh it's a first responder yes that is not looked at commonly as that and the reason i say it's a first responder is because when you're going through the shittiest portion of your life that's the first voice that's going to help you and they got to listen to the worst part of your life happen behind you Mm -hmm. whether it's your child's choking your partner is trying to kill you your car is on fire your dog ran away your cat stuck in a tree it doesn't matter what it is to you, you called 911 because you've got no other outlet. And that person has to take, the person taking that call, and this is just my perspective, has to take on your stress. It's very accurate. And they they take on your stress and they have to be calm, cool, and relaxed so you can stay calm, cool, and relaxed. And that's a very hard thing to do. And I sent you a video link, or I'm, I don't think it was a video link. I sent you a audio recording of a Chicago PD officer it was yes. shot in the line of duty. It was yes. a female. This happened recently. And another officer was shot. And the dispatcher was the shit. Yes. I mean, the way that I would want my dispatcher to be. And this dispa- dispatcher jumps on. Not only does he control the airwaves, he he knows the routes that are available for the patrol units. He knows. He's, he's anticipating. Mm-hmm. All right. He's controlling the air. He's not letting anybody talk that doesn't need to be talking. And I'll fully admit, officers, uh, we're the worst. We're the worst. We need you to know that we know that we're on the way yeah. or that we are coming to save the day, whatever it is. You know, officers just been shot. Just get there. Yes. I don't need you to jump on the air and tell me, hey, I'm in route. I'm going that way. Shut the fuck up. Just get there. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter. And the dispatcher understood that. So in this call, the dispatcher not only understands that, controls the air, tells people to stay off, only allows the people that need to be talking to talk. This was the part that impressed me the most. An officer says, I'm going to take this officer that's been shot to this hospital. And that dispatcher says, 
Do not take that officer there. They do not have trauma. How the fuck <clears throat> do you know that as a dispatcher? Mm-hmm. That is honing your freaking career and profession. He knew that that officer needed to go somewhere that had a trauma center. Yes. And not only that, the officers that were out there that were blocking the roadway to get those officers to the hospital, he's like, I need officers here. I need officers staged here. I need officers staged there. He knew the route. He knew where traffic needed to be cut off at. So when I'm talking about dispatch and the importance of their job, people's lives, not just not just officers' lives, which is the example I gave, but other citizens' lives, depend on the skill set of a dispatcher. And if you don't pay them, respect them, and prop them up where they deserve to be, you're going to get the quality of person that you're allowing. It's, it's, right now it's a nationwide crisis. Um, every, almost every call center, uh, there's different versions of what you call it. Call center, division, PSAP, which stands for Public Safety Answering Point. Um, they're all in crisis. There's very few that are fully staffed. Uh, we are woefully understaffed. And part of that problem is that historically call takers and dispatchers were an afterthought. And, and I'm not trying to bash on anybody for this. The reason is because most people, it's just a voice on the radio or a voice on the phone. And if you don't take the time to come down there and see the people behind what you're hearing, then it is just a voice on the radio. Right. And I'll, I'll ask you this. You've heard dispatchers your whole career. Mm-hmm. Did you ever form a picture in your mind of what they looked like? Absolutely. And did you know that's probably not even anywhere close not, to what it really is? Nope. <laughs> not even close. Cause so, I, Cause I've gone down and looked. Yeah. And I will tell you this, that um, the state of Texas is one of the few States last year classified public safety communicators as first responders. Uh, there's a nationwide push to recognize them as first responders because, you know, money's everything. And in the workman's comp area classifications, federal classifications, public safety communicators are classified as administrative technicians, office help. Yeah. And nothing could be further from the truth. Um, we're doing some things right now to try to pull them away from that that feeling in the city itself. Um, but Texas took the, took the lead with other states, and I don't remember, you know, I don't recall how many have, as, have now classified public safety communicators as first responders. Now it's up to us to push through what that means. Yeah, champion the cause for them. And I, I've said this for a long time, that division, communications is the most important division in the city. Because that's where everything starts. Right. And to think that they don't take on or get affected by what they hear over the phone is just naive. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you you know, you remember when I would tell y'all that remember the call that you take, it might be an hour or two out of your day, but that's the worst moment that that person's going through, possibly that they've ever been through in their life. Mm -hmm. These call takers are averaging 2,000 calls a day, not in each individual, but in the division. We are averaging 100,000 calls a month now. Wow. And each and every one of them has that potential. So we as police officers might take 10 or 15 calls in a day they take 10 or 15 calls in less than a half an hour. Yeah. And it's just relentless. Yeah. And I think that we have been woefully uh, ineffective at dealing with their mental health and their physical health because they're sedentary all the time. Mm -hmm. Uh, They get very few breaks. Some of them are working 12 hour shifts now. So just imagine, just, just, just extrapolate the number of calls that I'm telling you about yeah. and, and understand what they go through every single day. Yeah. It's, it's a beat down. And what is the, um, what's the word? Uh, turnover. It's very How high. hard. Is it to keep anybody? You, we either have ones that have been there for a while or ones that have only been there for a minute. Yeah. Uh, the ones that are in between are the ones that are going to the, be there for a while. 
Um, the, the, the turnover is very high amongst the first two years of employment in, mm-hmm. in, a, in a public safety communicator position. Okay. So we know there's issues as a person that the, you've got the unique benefit that you're in a, a leadership role and it's outside of your career field in a, in a sense, mm-hmm. meaning that they're not peace officers or none of that. So um, outside looking in, what are the what are the major issues right now? We don't have enough people. So you don't have enough people, and why is that? Is it the stress of the job? Is it the pay? Uh, <laughs> There's some things that I can't say right now. Okay. Um, well, uh, you don't have to give specific to where you're at. Well, I want general generalization uh, nationwide. The, the generalization nationwide is that it's an afterthought. Um, nobody feels comfortable and. and the way I say this, and it's not a, I'm not bashing anybody because I understand it. It's, it's, a, it's an, an element amongst its own. Uh, this is my second time through communications. Uh, I went there as a lieutenant, as an acting captain for eight, seven months. And when I first went there, yeah, I knew who dispatchers were and I knew what call takers did and all this, so just the basic knowledge. But it's like being dropped on a planet, not Earth. They have their own language. They have their own um, stressors that Mm -hmm. we don't have. Uh, They have their own issues. And um, it's it's a totally different world. And most people don't want to expose themselves to a situation that is not harmonious. Right. And one of the problems with this profession and it's not a problem but one of the realities of this profession is it's toxic not because of the people that are there but because the job we're expecting them to do right just like a police officer yes and and even more so it's even more compounded for them because of the amount that they get yeah something like (laughs) thank you the twist top all right it's a twist top yeah um i'm excited to try this you should be It's, it's it's, I'm like the raccoon. Oh, it's the worst thing I ever tasted here. Try it. <laughs> so just the environment itself, just the profession and the job that's expected of them, we have to be able to try to minimize that toxicity. So good. I figured you'd like it. And, and that's what people don't want to get involved in because maybe they, they're, they're afraid it'll brush off on them. Yeah. Um, the other aspect of it is... It, it, I'm going to speak frankly with you on this. We are sworn police officers, right? We're we're civil service personnel. Yeah. That building is full of civilians. A lot of sworn police officers are terrified of having to deal with civilians Mm -hmm. because of the horror stories that they've heard. It is nothing like that. Is there a bunch of them? Yeah. I wish there were more. And the first time I was in there, there were more. And we're working on getting more in, mm-hmm. but it's 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 a process to where you have to understand. In my opinion, when you go through that door to be that person for them, you have to understand you're fixing to put your money where your mouth is, because it's different in a division uh, as a lieutenant working a, a district or a, a division on a shift mm-hmm. where I might have fifty officers looking to me. Now, if we were fully staffed, I would have 156. Civilians? Civilians. Holy shit. I am nowhere near that right now. Oh, my God. Yeah. So it's it's overwhelming on its surface, and a lot of people shy away from that. You have to want to be there to be successful. Um, not necessarily want to be there like, gee, I want to be the, the commander over the communications division. <clears throat> I mean, want to be there as in I want to help them be able to do their job the best they can. Yeah. And so I think that's part of the problem because you and I both know that not everybody in a leadership position adheres to that philosophy. Yeah. And I think that's where, why we're where we are today. Yeah. I, um, I think if I were to give one tip to anybody on leadership, your sole purpose is to give the guys underneath you the tools they need to succeed. Absolutely. That's it. Absolutely. Hands down. That's all my job is. Yeah. Cause once that happens, it, 
yes, you want to do good at your job. I want to look good at my job. I want the people above me to, to, to think of me as a reliable person. If I make my team look good, I'll, I'll look good. That's, that's just the way it goes. And I'm not saying to do it to look good or, or whatever, but if your purpose is to try to look good all the time, you're never going to take care of the people that matter. And it's, it's counterintuitive or it's counterproductive. You're not, you're not giving them what they need to succeed. And if you're not giving what they need to succeed, they're never going to look good. Oh, I, you're, you're getting into a whole different yeah, conversation. I, I know, but <laughs> it, it drives me crazy. I this see this is where you need to black out my face yeah, yeah. and change my voice. <laughs> I see these, I see this, the, these empty uniforms and, and, and stuff out there. And it's not, just I'm not talking specifically where I'm at. I see it a lot on TV, mm-hmm. especially. Yes. I'm like, I can tell right away, like, you are an empty fucking uniform. You are not you're not there to help anyone. My best way of helping the citizens is giving my guys the tools they need to be good. And that's it. Um specific I give you an example. We need a UC car. We need an undercover car. Our car got deadlined. The AC went out. In mm-hmm. Texas, that fucking sucks. So on my own time, I secured a car just before you got here. <laughs> I, nice. got, I, I got a car coming to my team. So you, you see what I'm saying is yeah. this. And, you know, it's it's ironic. I'm, I'm developing a leadership course to teach in ATU because it's for the 40 hours. Need any uh, assistance? Sure. Um, <laughs> I'll always need You make all, the course. I'll just come help. I always need all the help I can get. Yeah. But what I have, uh, you know, and I have core beliefs just like anybody else does. Yeah. And I have always been one of those that believes that leadership is not something that can be taught because you can't. Yeah. We have had supposed leaders or people in leadership positions in our careers. Hold on. Did you just say you're creating a leadership course? Yes. And then you said you can't teach leadership. No, understand. You got to let me finish. <laughs> okay, I just I just want to make sure I heard you yeah, right. I swear. I want to make sure I heard you right. Okay, hey. do you do you skip to the back page of the book when you first start reading something to it see? Depends. It depends. Am I doing a book report? Okay. If I do yeah. a book report, yeah. I just read the just end. to get the cliff notes. But yes. Even then, you do the cliff notes. Yeah. <laughs> so here's what my take is on this. Okay. You, and I will say this: you have leadership qualities. Oh. You have leadership in your in your blood in your bones. Your father, you've you've been surrounded by leaders growing up. Yeah, you've had that environment. You've had that positivity. So I can't teach you to be a leader, but I can hone your skills. Oh, uh, okay. That's what the All right, is about. I got you. Right. I, got, I got you. Finally, an hour and ten minutes. I finally get yeah. a fist bump. I had to, I, <laughs> I had to let that develop. I guess. <laughs> So, so as far as, as what we're looking at as a nation, and I'm not going to try to sound like I'm, I'm Walter from, you know, Jeff Dunham, but. <laughs> the marionette. Yeah. Well, yeah, the, the, the ventral quest. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I mean, it's, it's a lot of times it's hard to not come across that way. And I, I qualify it with this. They say that life imitates art. And one of the best lines I ever heard to talk about people was in a movie. Okay. It was a little, little, little movie you might not have heard of called Men in Black <laughs> with Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones. All right. Well, they're standing there talking, and Will Smith has just discovered that there's aliens on, on the planet. And he says, well, why don't we tell people? Because they can handle it. Individuals. People are smart. Yeah. And Tommy Lee Jones' response was, a person is smart. People are stupid. Yeah. Nothing truer has ever been said. Yeah. Because I tell you that to tell you this. 911 is classified as what? An emergency number. Yes. Do you think that people only call 911 for emergencies? It's an emergency to them. Not necessarily. (laughs) Right. They call it because it's the number that they remember. Yeah. And that's, if anything defines us as a society right now, it's that. Yes. Because remember what I said. We're averaging 100,000 calls a, a month. Yeah. Um, unheard of. And it's because of where we have developed ourselves as a society. 
instantaneous gratification. I need it now. I want it now. Sunday, we had a plane crash in Lake Worth. Right. It was not in Fort Worth, but it was close enough. Military. Yep. We got inundated with 911 calls. Okay. The smoke is 5,000 feet up into the air. Yeah. I'm pretty sure if you're driving six miles away. You're going to see that shit. You're going to see it. Mm -hmm. But you should realize, because you see it, somebody else has probably already seen it and something's going on. Yeah. You don't need to call and say you see smoke in the air. They do. Yeah. Did you know something's on fire? Yeah. Yes, we do know something's on fire. The problem is we can't tell why the person's calling. I would love that. Yeah. So we could just go, you're out, you're out. Some of the calls that we got, because traffic backed up on Jacksboro Highway. People were calling 911. I'm I'm getting your disease. People were calling 911 to ask why the traffic was backed up. Then it backed up on the loop. Even more people called. Why is traffic backed up on the loop? Oh, my God. Yes. Calling calling 911. People call 911 for everything. And you know this. I mean, you've seen the call sheets. Yeah. And that's my biggest complaint is we are not utilizing the tools that we have properly as a society. Yeah. Um, Therefore, people that are in true emergencies, they unfortunately had a drowning uh, not in the same time frame, but because we're so understaffed and because the call load's increasing, people get put on hold. You would never want anybody calling 911 to go to hold. Yeah. But we do. And it's not just here. It's nationwide. Yeah. And like I said, you can't tell what that call is going to be. So someone that wants to call and tell us they lost their wallet is calling 911. Somebody whose father's having a heart attack is sitting in the hold line behind them. Yeah. I mean, it's tragic. So if I could do anything, anything, I would have a blunt, in-your-face public service announcement every single day. Yeah. Call 911 when it's an emergency. Mm -hmm. If it's not an emergency, think about the other avenues that you have available to you before you call anybody. Yeah. Because there's... Tremendous numbers of departments. An example, people call 911 to ask for the number to the property room. People call 911 to find out how they can find out if somebody's in jail. All that stuff's there, especially in, in today's age. Yeah. Google it. Yeah, Google it, for sure. But that, I think, is probably the biggest single, if there was a single issue, that's the biggest single issue. So right now we're working on PSAs to remind people. It's an emergency number. Yeah. Here's the word <clears throat> emergency. And I love the shows, but they don't help. Is there a liability issue with trying to define what an emergency is? Uh, it's Emergencies are pretty easily defined, in my opinion. I, I agree with you, but obviously they're not. Because even if you're putting out there that it's for emergencies only, like I said, what's not an emergency to me may be an emergency to somebody else. See Tommy Lee Jones. Yeah, exactly. Um, so that, that's where we are. Um, I will say it is very um, uplifting somewhat. We have received more applications than we ever have. Okay. So that's a plus. Yeah. Uh, the process is, is longer than people want it to be. Um, we're having to explain to our city leaders why I can't take Eric from Two Cops, One Donut bring him into my office and the next day have him answer 911 calls. They don't understand that. So we're yeah. trying to get them to understand. Okay. Because it is a process and it does take time and it is a certified position. We don't pay them that much. Really? And I money, mean, money's I, I not say, everything. I say really. I, I understand. I, I know that they don't get paid um, probably what they deserve. Between you and me, they should at least top out at what a rookie officer makes. That's my personal opinion. Okay. I can get on board with that. I, I firmly believe that. They are first responders. Yeah. Now, do they have the um, PTSD outlets, like 
22 kill, stuff like that. Is that something that's being looked at with that's, them? That's something I'm working on. Okay. Um, because I see part of Buck Wheeler. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the things he told me as uh, an academy instructor when I was working there is part of your job is to find the gaps in training and fill them. Yes. And so I'm like, okay, well, I kind of applied that to just life in general now. Um, so I give him credit for that. Uh, it's got a perspective or a verbiage that I never really considered before. And now that's all I ever do. Like it's, it's almost kind of a fault. Like it eats up a lot of my time. I'm just constantly trying to find gaps. Let me ask you a question. This has to do with leadership. Okay. What we were talking about earlier. So it's not necessarily that he taught you something new. He just put a definition on it for you. Yeah. There it is. Yeah. That's absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. It's just a way of. It's all about experience. Yeah. And if you can gain that from someone else. Yeah. You're going to be way ahead. of yep. Somebody that has to go through that themselves in order to learn it. Right. And, and listen to it. Mm-hmm. That's a, I think that's one of the, you talked about coasting in life. I think that's one of the, the ways I coasted was because most of the time it was only, I, I can actually tell, I can remember the times that I ignored advice from, oh, yeah. from people, but, um, almost always I would, if my grandpa told me something, I wouldn't like it, but I'd listen to it. All right, I'll try it. Mm-hmm. And I don't think I did it out of wisdom. I think I did it out of either laziness or because I didn't want to piss him off. Those were the two major reasons for most of the stuff that I did that I listened to experience. Mm-hmm. And then it took me a long time to realize, like, dude, the reason you coasted for so long is because either out of my own fear, laziness, I listened, and it helped me avoid dumb shit. And uh, I once I once I figured that out for myself about myself, like now it's like it's a thing. Like mm-hmm. it's a, a you know people that I know and I trust. Uh, you, my dad, you know Buck, um, Stephanie Riggs. You know I could keep going down the list of all these people that like I trust and I love the way they lead and the way they do the job or they live their life. You know whatever it is, I listen to it now. But I it took me a long time to figure that out. Like how the hell did I get where I'm at? It didn't take you as long as you think. It's a lot of happy accidents, in my opinion. You know, I always remember when I was a kid, my dad cut something out of the newspaper and put it up on the refrigerator. What's the newspaper? Uh, and it said, <laughs> it said, learn from the mistakes of others because you'll never live long enough to make them all yourself. <laughs> that's, and that's, and that's, that's stuck with me. That's the damn truth. Yeah. yeah. Um, so with that, uh, fill in the gaps and stuff like that. Um, What's the, what's the solutions to, what, what do you, if you were president for the day, if we were to give dispatch everything they needed to be successful and be awesome, what would you give them? Pay is always the first thing everybody says because that's the easiest way to show respect, mm-hmm. in my personal opinion. That's the easiest way to show someone they're valued. Yeah. Uh, so that's a no-brainer. Like I said, I would make sure that at the minimum they topped out at what a rookie officer made. Okay. Um, then I would provide them with a, a, an outlet because the, the stressors and the, the emotional pressures are there. They're always going to be there. And that's the first thing, in my opinion, that needs to be dealt with. Because I have to sit there and listen to these 20-something-year-old individuals that are leaving and I'm talking to them, and they just tell me, I just can't, I can't take it anymore. At 20. Yeah, oh, 20s. Mid, yeah, mid-20s. Because you can start dispatching when you're 18. Mm-hmm. And some of them have. And it's just so sad to sit there and look at someone who's realistically burned out. I mean, saying burned out is, is, is so cliche. Yeah. But this is absolutely true. Yeah. And, and to sit there and see this young person who came in here so full of hope, wanted to help, thought that they were going to be able to, you know, help everybody. And you and I both know some people just don't want to be helped. Mm-hmm. To see that 
happen to them is tragic. Yeah. So I would make sure that they were taken care of as best as possible psychologically. Mm -hmm. Then I would offer them physical care, physical health. I bet you would. Just like with, just like with <laughs> what we do with the officers. Yeah. Okay. I'm paying you a thousand dollars a year to stay in shape. Who's to say we shouldn't do that with them? Because they are in sedentary areas. And if your health starts to decline, your mental aspects start to decline with it. Right. I mean, let's just be realistic. These are human beings that are sitting there doing this for us. Yeah. We're asking them to do this. So why wouldn't we do everything we could think of to make sure they had the best possible health and mental stability that they yeah. could get? And the healthcare side, they're... How long are their shifts? Uh, I've got some working eights and some working twelves. So you got eight, ten, twelve, anywhere between there, mm -hmm. sitting in a cubicle. Probably no windows because sound is probably important. No, there's there's windows, but you don't have time to look at them. Okay, so well, that's good. Um, but the possibilities out there that there are some dispatchers that don't even have windows. That's true. So. We're talking a job that you sit on your ass. Where's 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 the equipment coming from? Let's put it that way. Where's your chair coming from? If you're gonna sit that long, you know who takes their chairs seriously? Truck drivers. Mm -hmm. Truck drivers take their chairs seriously. Oh, it's and and trust me, um, seating in this business is big money. Right. So um, I I've considered it myself just for this. This area, just for me, there's a there's a chair that. Yeah, makes I noticed you... your chair is much better than mine. So. Oh no, this that's the new one. Oh, is this this the new is one? the old one. <laughs> um, so there's chairs out there that are for posture and all that stuff. Like, because I, I try. Like, my favorite position is is slouching back. Obviously, because uh, I get sciatic issues. Oh, you're human. Yeah. Oh, gee. But um, I looked into chairs for posture and stuff like yes. that. I mean, you're. You're you're not getting away with a posture chair that that is quality for that type of time for anywhere under a thousand bucks. One of the things that's good about it is most of the companies now, um, in fact, ours that we've had for several years now uh, have the ability to raise and lower. So yeah, they can stand up during the shift, which is oh, benef hugely okay. beneficial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the things that I tried to do when I was there the first time back in sixteen and seventeen that I'm that's on my list to do now is there's a lot of products out there that allow them to have movement while they're seated. Um, you know, pedals that they can do like a bicycle. Um, there's different types of chairs. There's been all sorts of different gimmicks. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and this one probably wouldn't work, but they make a treadmill now for a desk. Really? Where you can stand up and walk on the treadmill while you're working. Oh, that would be nice. Just anything. At least have the option. Yeah, and that's all I'm offering. You know, yeah. that's all I'm saying is we don't need to force anybody to do anything. Yeah. But at least have the, have the option there. Yeah. Because for two reasons. One, it makes them feel better. And two, it shows that you care. Yeah. Again, back to the humanity of everything. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's naive maybe in some people's minds to think that things are so simple, but they really, really are. Yeah. And yeah, I say it's, the, it's all about the humanity. But that encompasses so much. Right. And you know, I and just like what you talked about before, getting people that work with you what they need to do the job, it's an easy thing to say, and it encompasses everything. Right. Part of the, the importance, and in, in I had Roxanne Farron on here, and we talked about health, mental health, um, nutrition, mm -hmm. how that all is like this trifecta of factors that play how well how good of an officer are you going to receive on your call yep because if their mental health is off or their nutrition is off because they're working midnights and they're eating fast food all the time because it's the only thing available or you know not to mention the the other mental health side with your family because now you're on midnights and the the stress of that all those factors play into the type of decision making that an officer is going to make absolutely and the type of encounter you have with them now let's put that over on a dispatcher you're sitting on your ass mm -hmm. you're probably not eating the best because you're stuck in a building that is correct okay and they are stuck in the building right they're stuck stuck in the building 
And if you're working midnights, now you don't see the sun. And that has a huge factor on your health and mental health. So you get all these factors, not to mention everything they typically hear on the phone is negative. So now you're creating a cynic. It could be the most positive person in the world. If all you smell is shit and all you hear is shit, eventually <laughs> that's going to be the way you see things. Well, and it's interesting because the, 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 the public safety communicators follow the same path that police officers do. Yes. Um, two years is the typical burnout type. Mm-hmm. Um, another course that we're developing for ATU. Um, and I see it. I saw, I saw it in the field. I was a victim of it in the field. Me too. I see it in in this side of the building or this side of the job too. Yeah. Because what did I tell you? Most of the ones that I've had that have resigned recently have been within the last two years, Mm -hmm. sometimes three, but in that same general area. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons why. And it's because we fail. Yeah. And and I have no problem saying that. We, We are failing our people. Yeah. So if you focus... It, like I, like we talked about, the tools they need to succeed. It's not just physical tools. It's not just that. You also have to take into account mental, physical, nutrition. All of those things are going to affect the type of person that you get behind that phone. And I want the person during my hardest crisis in my life that I had to call 911 for to be on top of their game as well. Or me as an officer. I want that person to be spot on. And if you neglect that circle of things, it, you, like you said, you, you basically you're creating you're creating your own issues. No, exactly. It's a snowball. Yeah. It, well, now it's an avalanche. Right. Because the people that want to do the job are still there. Yeah. And now they're being asked to do more, and we're just piling on top of them. And they're understaffed. Oh, you don't even know. So, so that's my worry. That's my concern, and it's so frustrating not to be able to fix that immediately. Right. Um, Because it's not hard. The fixes itself aren't hard. It's just getting people to jump on board. Well, the number one thing right now is I I need bodies. Yeah. I need bodies, and I've got them. Yeah. But now I have to train them. Right. And and the the amount of time that that takes, I'm afraid I'm going to lose more. Yeah. So now I'm looking at, yeah, I just hired X number of people, but that doesn't even keep up with my attrition in the last three months. Mm-hmm. So now I have to try to push these other ones through. Yeah. So we're talking about different stuff and thinking about different stuff, but for the here and now and the immediate, it's it's just nothing but frustration. So I'm not experienced in this where you're at, but me as an officer who's been in police work for 17 years, one of the first things that I would think to do as a immediate something that we could do to to help alleviate them is if you are a injured officer that is capable of working you are a call taker we're doing that now that's beautiful and if anybody out there is listening to me it, nothing more frustrating as an officer you're out there like did this happen is this the you're asking the dispatcher questions and you're like uh, the call taker will call back or we'll call back and we'll find out for you. Like an officer would have already asked these questions. That's one of the advantages that we've seen that I expected. Yes. Was that the officers that are taking the calls are getting better and more, better information. Yes. Uh, and again, it depends on the officer. Yep. Uh, I'm not going to tell you they've all been successful. Right. But we started that almost the, the first week I was there. Yeah. Um, and in fact, I'm fixing to ask for more that are on extended light duty. We actually have full duty officers coming down working. Really? Uh, we have one that came in, and within four weeks, he's already solo taking 911 calls, which is unheard of. Makes sense, though. But they ha- he has that experience, and, yeah. and that's the we're, we're trying to push that more and more in addition to what we're doing for hiring mm-hmm. permanent employees. Um, so, yeah, it's it's absolutely a plus. Yeah, I, I'm, like You'd I said. You'd be surprised how much quicker some of them heal when they get put down there too. Really? <laughs> I, I I can tell you, you know, if if I'm injured and I know I'm capable of, because uh, that's the frustrating part when you get hurt. You're like, shit, like I I want to do something. Been there. And, um, Several not, times. Not everybody's that way, and I get that, and I don't expect everybody to, to act 
the way that I do. I got my own drives and that's mm-hmm. a drive for me. So, um, in my drive, like I want to do something. I had, I hurt my, I hurt my something turned off. Yeah, I heard that. <laughs> I don't know which one it was, but something turned off. Well, uh, you'll find out later. I'll find out later. Yeah. So that's uh, the NSA shutting you down. Yeah, right. <laughs> so for me, um, I want to get back to work. Like I want to do something. I want to earn yeah. my paycheck. Um, but it's fun. And that would be different. Like for me, well, that would be different. Absolutely. And I can tell you the ones that have come down there, a majority of them have told me that they were glad they did. They didn't want to. Did Inman go down there by chance? Yes. I, I knew he, I, I heard he was possibly going down there. Well, but, and we're probably getting back. I think he just recently had surgery. So. Yeah. Um, great detective. Mm-hmm. Um, he's still a fresh. Well, one of my rookies. When I was a lieutenant. Really? Yeah. Still, he was out of my academy. Yeah. Um, great. Uh, I mean, just immediately got to the detective's office and, and started just like trying to learn everything he could. Yes. Um, he thinks outside the box. Uh, so he's really good. And then when I heard he was going down there, I was like, dude, um, if you get down there, I was like, this is, and that's why I brought it up to he's, you. He's turning into Carl Perkins. I don't know if you noticed that or not about him. I did not. Oh, he's got the lamb chops and everything. It's awesome. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Uh, but no, he's he's good people. Yeah, he's good dude. And and that's you know it's across the board. Eric, yeah, that if somebody's good out there in the field, they're going to be good wherever they go. Yeah, because you're not good in the field because of the field. Right. It, it's comes from within. Mm-hmm. Everything we do comes from within. Yeah. There's some caveats. If you were to take Johnny Cox out of the field, I don't know that he'd be good anywhere else. No, yeah, that's another. That's another conversation. <laughs> Anybody listening out there, Johnny Cox is like a legendary. Uh, he's a patrolman's patrolman. Like that's what he does. And uh, great FTO trains a lot of rookies out there. So uh, you need guys like that. You need guys that are dedicated to uh, honing their craft out there in the field as a patrolman. You need guys like Robin that promote up, but keep things the same all the way up and. It's hard to find. That's very humbling. Thank I you. don't, uh, maybe you can school me because you are, I mean, you're literally as close to the highest rank as you can get without being appointed. Yes. So why do, why is it that people that were great officers sometimes, it seems from the lower level where I'm at, it, it that disappears. Why does that happen? What is the pressure from a top? From the top, what what are the stressors? It can't just be from a chief. It's got to be from. There's got to be political things. There's got to be all these different factors. I'm just curious what the factors are once you get that high. My dad, he gave up. He didn't. He didn't get any higher than lieutenant because he's a he's a puss. I, and so I I tell him that. Well, he found a niche. Yeah, he did. And and different people do. And I will tell you this. Um, 16 years of my career, I was a sergeant. You were a sergeant for 16 years? Yes. Holy shit. And there were reasons for that. Yeah. Um, I actually had a chief directly contact me and say, you need to take the test. And I was told by my wife at the time, you're an idiot for not taking the test. Because he obviously has certain things in mind. And, you know, she was probably right. But I didn't want to do that. Mm -hmm. Because at the time, the lieutenant rank, wasn't what I wanted to do. Yeah. And it wasn't until we got a new chief that put lieutenants back in the field, which I was for you, a, f- a, sh- a shift lieutenant, yep. that I decided to take the test. A shift lieutenant who took calls, ladies and gentlemen. Took calls. I like to work. Yeah. Not just took calls and was like, all right, I made an arrest. Can you help me out with the paperwork over here? Motherfucker took him down to the jail, processed them, did, did it all. And that, that is one of the rarest qualities because I cannot tell you a lieutenant to this day that I know of personally that can take a call, arrest somebody, do the paperwork, and go to the jail. I don't know any of them. I don't know another one to this day. I'm sure they're out there. I don't know if I could do it now with all the changes. Yeah. But my, my belief has always been, how can I talk to you about your job if I don't know what your job is? Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> so to answer your question as delicately as possible, mm-hmm. 
look at the examples in front of you. Look at the examples from other places and see the path that people choose. And you can tell from your own experience, people that were young in the career, you knew which path they were going to choose. Okay. One's no better than the other, Mm -hmm. but it's just a choice. Do I want to do this and follow my, my desires to be this, a helper, a community servant, that sort of thing, or do I want to do this? Right. And do I want to be on the street, or do I not want to be on the street? So, and you can see it. Yeah. The, the issue that has been time immemorial is the rift that occurs between the two. And I told somebody this just the other day. When there's a, a when there's a dispute between management and those they manage, it's the responsibility of management to to bridge that gap. Yeah. It absolutely is. And I've done both. I've been on both sides of the aisle. Um and I can tell you that for a fact because who has the ability? Yeah. So then it boils down to what is it that you want to do? And it again, it sounds real simple, doesn't it? But it's true. Mm-hmm. One of the things that I told him when I went back over there, I, I, I got moved there in June. I've only been there for three months and some change. Is that we have to make this what we need it to be, and no is not an acceptable answer until we have done everything we could possibly do, even the things that we can't think of yet. Because that's the only way you're going to get your way out of this. Yeah. And it's going to get worse before it gets better. You know, and it's unfortunate. Because there's people out there that need us. And all we can do is the best we can. Yeah. And I'm not sitting there going, oh, we're doing the best we can. Because we are thinking every day, what can we do different? What can we do different? And as a profession, that's where we fail all the time is we don't evaluate what it is that we're doing on a regular basis. Yeah. We say, well, let's try this, and that's all we do. One of the things I want you to look up, and you may have heard me talk about this before, was three monkeys in a cage. It's an analogy that I used to use all the time, and I got it from the tactical world. Mm-hmm. And then I found out last year that that was actually a study that was done back in the 50s. Okay. So look that up. Three, right. three monkeys in a cage. The basic premise of it is we do it this way because we always have. Mm-hmm. And I, that is unacceptable to me. I hate that phrase, by the way. Well, it's unacceptable. I hate if, that. If you, and, and if you would regularly evaluate what it is you're doing, that wouldn't be a problem anymore. Mm-hmm. Because just because you think of something and you put it into place doesn't mean it's going to work. Right. And the assumption that that it will work is arrogant if you don't evaluate what you're doing. So one of the things was the light-duty officers. We started it in one way, and it doesn't look anything like it did three months ago because we continue to evaluate the process. That wasn't me. I'm not the shit. I have people. There's other people. All I'm doing is giving them the freedom that they need to be able to grow in what it is they're capable of. Yeah. That's all it takes. Yeah. I'm, I, as an instructor side, like that was one of the biggest frustrations. Well, that's the way we do things or that's the way it's been done. I'm like, did you ever see, did you ever look to see if it's been done different? Or the other one that I really hate is, um, have you, you come up with this idea has it been done before? Did you ever check to see if it's been done before? Benchmarking, yeah, and best practice. God, Jamie Johnson, yes, was the like saving grace because he had been at the academy for so long. He's like, we we tried that, we we did that, we did this, we, all these ideas you're coming up with, they're not new. We did it. Yeah, and see, that's the advantage, like I said, of being around long enough. Yeah, 
<laughs> you know, so. I feel like I'm the old man sitting at the edge of the village in the hut with all the chicken <laughs> bones around it. And, Everybody you thinks know, you're nuts, yeah, but everything yeah, you say, yeah, is, we can't do that. We yeah. already did, but you know, we did. Yeah. And, and, you know, celebrate the innovation. Yeah. Have faith. What a slap in the face. If somebody comes to you with innovation and you tell them, no, check and see if anybody else has done that. Nobody's done it. Mm-hmm. Nobody's done it. Yeah. Well, then we shouldn't do it. Why not? Right. If it works, yeah. why not? And one of the things I like about our department, in my opinion, is the willingness and the openness to try the new stuff. It Everything that I've seen, like Axon body cameras, um, flock camera system, um, shit, what else? LPRs. Uh, um and look at everything you're just talking about. Look yeah. at the people that that uh, ramrodded those projects. Yeah. And look at the people above them. Right. And you will see that they were allowed yeah. to think outside the box. Yeah. They were allowed to be innovative. Mm-hmm. They, you know, the, our camera system is a perfect example. Yeah. Because fortunately, the people that were around that could say yes or no allowed them to be innovative. Right. Yeah. And, and being and, successful doesn't hurt. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, and uh, man, I just, it's one of my favorite things about working where I work is just the, the progressiveness. Um, can we be better? Fuck. Always. We can always be better. There's always ways to improve. But when I look at us compared to where I came from or other places I've seen, God, we're light years ahead. That's right. But don't, mm-hmm. don't rest on your laurels. No, absolutely. I'm with you. So, but, uh, I I have so many other things that I want to talk to you about. Sure. Um, but it, and it's the benefit of having a friend that's got thirty six years <laughs> behind the wheel. Um, but I don't want to. I don't want to uh, blow it all in one episode. Sure. Obviously. So, um, what's uh, what's going on with you now? Like uh, you're you're running a communication center. What's the What's the prospects for the rest of your career right now? Like, what do you, where do you see the future going? I have no idea. No idea? No. Um, as a captain, I'm at the mercy of the command staff. True. Um, well, I know what I think should be done. Okay. Um, but that's just my opinion. Right. I gotcha. Um, for future down the road, you're a POA member. Yes. And a... What what is your function in the PUA? I'm a former board member. Former board member. That's what yeah, it was. I'm not on the board now. Okay. But I'm very active. Yes. So we got that. Um, you're also a bagpiper. <laughs> <laughs> That's only because of the phone call. I, I, I don't want to uh, insult any bagpipers out there. I have bagpipes. I know how to blow in one end and get sound out of the other. Okay. Um, I'm getting better. Um, unfortunately, um, we are going Monday to Houston to play a funeral for an officer that was killed there this last week. So, and that's the reason I got into this. Okay. Um, if I may, if I may, mm-hmm. um, never thought about it. And then we lost Hank and we had nothing like this. And I remember seeing the Austin pipes and drum band came up here from Austin on their own, it was freezing cold, and they stayed out there, and they stayed with us the whole time, and they sent a hero home. Yeah. Made such an impression upon me. And anything I can do, no matter how big or small it is, to 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 facilitate that honor. Yeah. Because just like with anything else, sometimes the tradition – it's lost because people don't understand it. Mm-hmm. And I'll give you a for instance. I never knew when I watched whatever, police funerals on TV, YouTube, tele- you know, television dramas, I never understood. And in funerals that I'd been to, because unfortunately I've been to several officers' funerals, funerals I've been to where the bagpiper playing Amazing Grace, which is a standard at funerals because it's it's – encompasses everything at the end a solo bagpiper walks away 
And I never understood that. Well, now I know what it means. Basically, that is symbolic of that bagpiper walking that hero's soul to heaven. Mm -hmm. So it's things like that. Yeah, It's the traditions like that and the meanings behind them that I'm trying to keep alive. Yeah. And right now, I'm just, I make noise, and I'm trying to do better. But yeah, yeah I, I play the bagpipes. Nice. I'm not going to lie. I would love to learn how to do that as well. I have it's, no it's musical the talent. absolutely the most frustrating thing I've ever done in my life. <laughs> but it is absolutely worth it. If my daughter can figure out how to play piano and the violin, I got no excuse. Well, come on. <laughs> I could try to figure it out. So I'll let you, I'll let you help me out with that. Sure. But, um, I don't have anything else right now. Okay. I, I mean, I do. I have a ton with you. Um, there's so much more that you and I can accomplish. We got the, uh, benefits and, uh, the pro let's go the pros and cons of a, uh, union for police. Yes. You know, POA. So, um, I would love to discuss that side of the house with you. Sure. Um, and the, the function basically between that and not just with the citizen, because there's a lot of good things that happen with cit- the the community that they're they're with um, that people don't hear about. Yeah, cops for kids. Shout yeah. out to that. Yeah, stuff like that. Um, I want to talk about somehow you're a hockey fan. Um, <laughs> it's just very rare. Growing up in Texas, yes. yeah, for, I love, for I've Texas loved guy. hockey ever since I yeah. could. We actually had pro hockey teams when I was a kid. See, that's a, so okay. I, you know me; I grew up. I love hockey. I played it. I grew up with it. It is. It's in my DNA. And then this guy, he's got season tickets to the Dallas Stars. So luckily, we shared that that bond, <laughs> and uh, I'm able to go to some hockey games this each year. And anytime he asks me, I'm like, "Yep, I'm down." So. Uh, yeah, we'll discuss that. I mean, there's just a lot of cool things that I know I can talk with you about. I want to do, it's not necessarily a retiree. I don't want you to feel like I'm pushing you out of no, the career field, that's but fine. I, old school cops. I want, like, if I could get you, uh, cowboy, my dad, Jamie, um, Scott Jenkins, uh, just, I mean, Paul, there's, there's a, I eventually, this is, this is my, my brain. This is where I want to go. I want to get um, wireless mics and a couple cameras, and I just want to sit outside. I want to be around a campfire. Y'all sure. can smoke cigars, sip some whiskey, and just old school stories. Just cut it up. Get strip matter. Get some of those guys. You know, well, if you get strip matter, it'll you'll have to do it in like parts. Yeah, because <laughs> he's so he, long winded. He likes to talk. <laughs> yeah, he does. Bless his heart. Yeah. So I want to get all you guys, and it just be a a war story episode. It doesn't have to be anything specific we don't have to educate people on anything i just want them to see when when the old school officers get together the stuff like for me that i i appreciate and love and just sit back and enjoy when y'all get together and dumbass rookies like me sit around i'm just like fucking (laughs) awesome that's that's what police work was about you know stuff like that so that's i i've got i got a lot of ideas um i don't know if i told you but i got a sponsorship Finally. Yes. Uh, oh, I did tell you. Yes. yes. So um, it's temporary. It's a two-month thing um, to see where it goes, but that will help. Maybe eventually you'll help me in the thing you said you'd help me with. Sure. Um, I, I haven't seen anything with that yet because you just keep ignoring me. Yeah, so. that's what it is. Because <laughs> you're not busy. Um, but, yeah, so that's what I want to do, and I want to talk about some of the specialized units you've been in, sure. things like that. But, uh yeah, I could see having you come back several times, and I told you that before. But um, now that you've done this, would you be willing to come back? Absolutely, my pleasure. See, like doing this. It's well, fun. I wanted to come before, and it just didn't work out. So right. Well, at your age, maybe it's, it's hard. Maybe it's providence. It, uh, <laughs> it could be. Yeah, yeah it could it, be. Keep it up, and then how are you going to explain to your wife and kids that this old man whipped your ass? Yeah, I, I wouldn't fight back. <laughs> there ain't no point. So, well, brother, what is it they say? Yes, I'll fight you, but remember, I'm old for yeah, a reason. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I like uh, new lions for old men, or whatever it is. And they they're sitting there talking about. Uh, damn it, they're at the bar. Do you remember that scene? They're at the bar, and there's the young kids come in. Oh yeah, yeah. And uh, the one dude says something to the effect of like, "He didn't get there for no <laughs> no That's reason." Exactly correct. You know what I mean? So yeah, but I appreciate you being out here, brother. 
No, thanks for having me. Yes, sir. I appreciate it, man. All right. I'll 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 give you a beer menu. A beer. Next time, I, next time I will get you, get you the beer that you deserve. Yeah, peanut butter and jelly. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's good stuff. Thanks. All right, brother. This episode of the podcast has been brought to you by flocksafety.com backslash two cops. That's F L O C K S A F E T Y dot com backslash the number two and the word cops, C O P S, flocksafety.com backslash two cops. And I am also announcing that they are releasing a brand new device on October 19th. I can't share any of the details here, but think what if you could solve gun violence like a drive by shooting, car break ins in real time? fights that break out, reckless driving, well, you're going to want to check out their virtual product launch to find out how this brand new device will help you solve crimes in progress. Register for their virtual product launch on October 19th, and you can use Flock Safety to help you and your agency solve more crimes in real time. That's the bonus part, in real time, guys. One more time, check out flocksafety.com backslash two cops.